what AI has done is because these models are, you know, they're billion parameters, they're like very sophisticated models, they're able to extract nuances about these sentences in many, many dimensions. Like some of these models are like thousand plus dimensions, right? So they're able to extract all these nuances of the thing that you're searching for. And beforehand, you have already extracted nuances about various retail products. It could be descriptions, reviews. And I was talking about multimodal. It could be even images, right? It might have learned from those images things about like the letters that are on the purse or the type of strap you see in the image, whether it's a leather or a gold or silver, right? And then when the user's query comes, now suddenly you have a whole host of new dimensions to match user's intent with the things that the group of things that you're looking for. Welcome to It's About Data, episode 29. We're joined by Amit Ganesh, VP over databases and AI at Google, to discuss Target's recent search bar overhaul driven by Alloy DB AI. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we'd like to welcome special guest today, Amit Ganesh. He's VP of Engineering at Google Cloud. As you might kind of assume, when you, when you think about Google, you think about search and you think about AI. And that's really what we're going to be talking about for the next 15 minutes and, and looking at basically how the different forms of search really work together. And then, can you give us a little background on what your role is there? And then we'll kind of dive, and then we'll just, and, and then we'll dive in. F fantastic. Firstly, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really delighted to be here with the two of you uh, to discuss all topics, uh, search, databases, and any, anywhere else we, we end up going. Um, so yeah, I'm the VP of Engineering for Databases here at Google Cloud, uh, and I also lead the research and development for the area of AI in databases. And you know, we know that data is the fuel for AI, and there's just so much exciting, exciting things happening here. Um, so we, we have a big focus at Google in both those areas, of course, and I'm, I'm excited to come here and share that with you. It, it, and, and AI and databases, it, I mean, like we could go on talking for hours, which is basically AI to operate databases, AI in databases, you know, in databases to access AI services. But I think what we want to focus on today is really, you know, draw us at, you know, as I said before, really the roots of who Google is, how you folk, and, and, and how this is, and how, you know, with AI and with the, with the new forms of AI, because we've had AI for a long time. We've had classical AI, but now we have generative AI language models. And that's basically put into question, what are the different roles of the different forms of searches? <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting all choked up over that. You can see as a, it, we're, we're, we're approaching you know, quite an inflection point here. So, uh, so Mitt, can you basically give us a little, little bit of color there and lead us in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a way to start this. Because as you know, like Google's uh, beginning is with search, right? And uh, that's kind of at the core of like how uh, Google um, has worked for years, like decades, I should say. Uh, but then the, the advent of AI, and I think you may be aware, Sundar Pichai announced uh, that Google is an AI-first company, I think back in 2016. Uh, it has, uh, if I may say this, it has almost been in the DNA of the company to build with AI infused into our products. Uh, and like you rightly said, both for our own products to perform well, like in terms of efficiency and other things, but also equally importantly, really for the products to be really helpful and useful for our customers as they go do day-to-day -day stuff with, their, with these products. So if you look at like Google's own apps, for example, we have infused our products with AI to create really rich and helpful experiences. Uh, all of our Google's billion user products use our state-of-the-art Gemini models and run AI in production at scale. Um, and I'll give you just one example. Uh, one that I just used recently, uh, and many of us use all the time, like one type of search, you know, if you look at Google Lens, for example, uses AI to really expand search to multimodal. And there's lots of reason to be very excited about it. Uh, it of course, we've all been playing with uh, uh, Nano Banana and all the fun things it can do with it. But it, multimodal truly has the ability to use text, images, video to transform. I mean, if you look at searches, experience for users. That's fantastic. I, yeah, I've long thought of Google as an AI company, even before we got into the current hype cycle. I mean, Google Brain, one of the first like really big production deployments of AI from my perspective. But I want to talk about Postgres right now. So Postgres, like very bulletproof, established, 
relational database has been around for a long time, but continues to evolve. How did we get to the point where Postgres was the basis of AlloyDB and also the basis of a scan? How do you pronounce it? Just scan, I think, which is Google's version of approximate nearest neighbor vector search, which is the basis of the search engine. How do we get to that point? So that's a great question. To give some additional context, also personally, uh, I've been involved with databases for 29 years. Actually, before Google, I spent more than two decades at Oracle uh, doing databases, working on things like Exadata and other things. So um, I've been very excited to frankly see the rise of Postgres uh, in, in the world. And I think, you know, Postgres is a uh, uh, majority of the developers, I think the latest stats show that are using Postgres as the de facto language for uh, doing SQL. Um, and by the way, SQL, I think, reached 50 years recently. So it's a very ex interesting time and exciting time as the world of AI uh, kind of transforms what happens next to databases. But one thing is clear that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, data is the fuel for AI, right? So it's you can't really do AI without having um, deep uh, integration with with the true business critical data that enterprises have. And this is where Postgres comes in, and Postgres has really uh, taken on and become the standard here. But many years ago, uh, I think you asked me about AlloyDB, many years ago when we were looking at like, hey, what should we, what SQL dialect should we standardize on? Um, we took a bet on at that time, and it was already quite popular, not as much as today, but uh, uh, with AlloyDB, we said like, hey, we wanted to truly create a 100% Postgres, and I, I mean 100%, like not 99.9%, like truly 100% uh, Postgres compatible database. But then infuse in that database, uh, you know, Google's uh, technology, like you mentioned Google Brain, for example. So one of the things that we have done is uh, we have taken, um, actually speaking of search, uh, maybe step back for a moment here. Um, you know, in order to do those things like Google Lens and Google Search, you know, Google has had to solve some very big problems, right? And to do those problems really, solve them really, really well for customers, we actually pioneered, and you're right, that we started on AI way, way long before, and it was really there to truly build AI infrastructure and AI technology that can be deployed at scale to solve those big problems. And that's where Google Brain, Google Research, and DeepMind really comes in. And um, the one thing that we have done recently, uh, and there are many, many things, but I'll talk about Scan for a moment, which is we have taken open source Postgres, but then uh, we have, through a close collaboration with Google Research and Google DeepMind, uh, taken the Scan technology. Many people don't actually know what this is, but this is Scan is S-C-A-N-N. This is the underlying um, AI algorithm, you could say, that uh, powers actually Google search and YouTube recommendations and whole, including Google Lens and a whole host of Google properties. This is actually what powers these services. We have taken that same algorithm uh, and put that into AlloyDB so that every user of Postgres, so right. standard SQL dialect, something called PG vector to do vector searches, can avail of the same technology that users avail when they do Google searches. And that's one of the reasons why customers like Target have been so successful at adopting uh, the same Google search technology through LIDB and, and seen some really great success with it. So let's go into the use case here. Uh, and basically the idea of that, of using, you know, you know, basically traditional keyword search, you know, the search that, that made Google famous, that put Google on the map, you know, with vector search, with, with, with approximate nearest neighbor search. Take us through the use case. I mean, obviously we can talk about the technology, you know, all day so we all turn blue and I think we're almost all wearing blue t-shirts. But, uh, uh, but let's go into in terms of like what each, you know, what's the role for each of those different types of searches and how they work together to produce a better customer experience? Uh, that's a great question, uh, Tony. Uh, you know, ultimately the job to be done, right? What is the job we are trying to do here? is really to match users' intent. Like it could be shopping, it could be to get information, really match users' intent with either information or in case of retail, it could be products, right? Um, and when you're doing that kind of a matching problem, uh, there are many ways of solving this, obviously. So if you go back like several decades, the standard way of doing this was actually keyword search, right? And keyword search to date is still used and very helpful and very relevant. But with the advent of AI, um, 
one way of thinking about it uh, of what has happened is AI is able to take words and more importantly, maybe phrases in natural language, because we are used to not just searching for words, but we are searching for things that we like to describe in a little bit more nuanced way. Like I'm looking for a purse with a leather you know, strap, et cetera. Like how do you capture that nuance of the search that goes beyond what you can do with just pure keywords and textual ma matching, understand the semantic meaning of what you're looking for, and complement what you can get with just textual map. And that is where AI really has been very powerful. And if I may just add, uh, and, and maybe giving you kind of a technical uh, tidbit that uh, I, I find really interesting, I think one way to think about it is like keyword search is more about like if you have a linear distance between words, you're kind of finding the linear distance between those two terms. What AI has done is because these models are, you know, they're billion parameters, they're like very sophisticated models they're able to extract nuances about these sentences in many, many dimensions. Like some of these models are like thousand plus dimensions, right? So they're able to extract all these nuances of the thing that you're searching for. And beforehand, you have already extracted nuances about various retail products. It could be descriptions, reviews. And I was talking about multimodal. It could be even images, right? It might have learned from those images, things about like the letters that are on the purse or the type of strap you see in the image, whether it's a leather or a gold or silver, right? And then when the user's query comes, now suddenly you have a whole host of new dimensions to match user's intent with the things that the group of things that you're looking for. So in many ways, like you can think of AI as like has truly complemented and taken that technology of keyword search to the next level. But in fact, both of them work uh, in conjunction with each other. And in fact, they work in conjunction with structured data in databases, which I'm happy to talk about that, why that's relevant as well. And uh, let me ask you this as well. So you already mentioned that data was the fuel that runs AI. And I, I mean, I've worked in retail, so I kind of know how this works. It's actually incredibly difficult to get to attach good quality data to products for a whole host of reasons. So I'm curious, what kind of data engineering backs this target search uh, to make sure that you're mapping the customer intent to the appropriate product, best quality product, best reviewed product, all these different parameters that you might be interested in? That, that's a really great question. Uh, I mean, I think there are kind of two sides of it. And um, I will say on the technology side, uh, you could say that in order to do this matching really, really well, um, let's just take one thing, right? Like you need these models to be really powerful in truly understanding what the user's ask is. Right. I mean, that's, of course, one of the things that you need. Um, and that could be, for example, how good is the model at detecting what it sees in an image? Right. And the quality of what you detect there is like super, super important. This is where all the work that Google DeepMind has done around um, around Gemini really comes to bear and has really helped helped a lot. So that's kind of one side of the house. Um, the other side, other piece that uh, is, is worth mentioning in, in the technology space is is in addition to the data itself, it is how you reason and process that data is really critical. So imagine that uh, you wanted to search for something, right? And you're searching for a red red bag. Um, a, a red, searching for a red bag will res result in a bunch of search results. Now imagine there was a human that went through a hundred of these results and handpicked which of the ten ones are the most relevant for the specific user that is looking for red bags, because there may be things about their history of searches or their, their personalized search history that might inform what that human should pick, right? Now imagine that there was an AI model that, <laughs> let's say, DeepMind built that acted like what that human did, honoring the personalized history of the specific user and matching and handpicking just the right set of results. Actually, that's the other part of innovation that we've done with Google DeepMind. We have something called semantic re-rankers that in addition to the data, they at runtime, they're essentially doing reasoning on your behalf to find what most closely matches your needs. So that's on the quality equation on the technology side. But then I have to say, like you, you mentioned Target there, I think Target themselves, uh, the, kudos to them. They've done a really amazing job. They have an awesome data science team that takes all this technology, puts it together, and ensures through very rigorous process that 
the results that they're getting of really high quality. And they won't have picked Google technology. I know they're very demanding. They won't have picked it without unless they were truly satisfied with it. Anyway, so just want to wrap up here with a couple, with basically kind of a, a compound question, which is one, is there any role for say knowledge graphs in all this? Mm. And the other is, where do you see this going from here? You read my mind, Tony. That's a great question. <laughs> I want to ask that, go for it. <laughs> mind melt here. <laughs> yes. It's a fantastic question indeed. Um, certainly knowledge graphs, like in knowledge models are a key, key element to this. In fact, Google uses it ourselves in search and it is an integral part of the search ecosystem. So you have text search, you have keyword search, you have knowledge graphs, and then you have the structured, uh, structured data sets, right? Like things that are telling you about the user's history, et cetera. So absolutely uh, affirmative on, uh, on the earlier question that you asked. You also mentioned like, hey, where, where is this going, right? So maybe I'll just mention uh, three things, uh, three interesting areas that uh, I know Target is looking at some of these and they've spoke about it in their blog and, and we are certainly doing a lot of research in this space. Firstly, everything is going multimodal, okay? Which means you, you point your device, you show a live video stream, you say some things using speech and speech, video, images, all of these are coming together to capture user intent. All of these are coming together to also analyze repositories of data to match against that user intent. Okay, so that's kind of one really open-ended and big problem that you'll see that will solve in the area of search in future. The other, the second one I would like to uh, mention is around reasoning. That it's helpful to have multimodality, eh? but then ultimately you'll have to reason about things. So if I say, hey, I want a red bag uh, with a leather strap, but uh, instead of a gold strap. I shouldn't be seeing results with a gold strap, but you know, keyword search or even vector search might show me that, right? So how much natural language understanding and reasoning would you be able to do this built into a system as well? And the last thing I'll mention is agentic, right? So once I express my intent, it should be multimodal, it should do reasoning. Like it'd be really nice if agents were doing some search and doing all of this work for me behind the scenes before helping me make my decision around shopping. So these are three. We, we don't know where the world's going to go. Things are moving super fast. But these are certainly three areas in which we're doing a lot of research and development together with some of our customers. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your insights about this. Um, th this is a fantastic discussion. And it, it's great to see uh, AI technologies deployed in a very concrete, practical, impactful way with frankly lower risk, right? Like search, there is risk, but it's less risky than having AI manage your code and security, for example, which is a whole <laughs> other topic. But it, anyway, we uh, we hope to have you back sometime. You're a database person, like that's very much our bread and butter. So it's thank you so much for taking the time and hopefully we'll get to meet again on another show sometime. Thank you very much for having me. And it was a real delight to, to speak with you today. Great talking, Amit. Thank, thank you. you.